evening. Welcome to the Hingham Board of Selectmen meeting for Thursday, October 5th, 2017. Um, before we begin the business of the town, I would just ask us all to pause for a moment of silence in memory of those who lost their lives or were injured in the tragic events that unfolded in Las Vegas earlier this week. Thank you. The first item on our agenda this evening is the approval of the minutes for the uh, selectman meeting dated September 26, 2017. Move to uh, approve the minutes as amended of September 26, 2017. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Public comment on items not on the agenda. Okay, with that, I'm just going to uh, give a quick overview of the meeting agenda um, for this evening. Uh, we're going to start out uh, with some discussion about two potential community preservation applications. We're going to talk about security camera procedures, and uh, we will conclude with, uh, with the financial forecast. The board is scheduled to go into executive session this evening. So uh, we are mindful of that as we, uh, as we work through the agenda this evening, the public portion of the agenda. Um, there are two potential community preservation applications, and because both of these projects uh, are situated on land that is owned by the town, uh, it is th this board, uh, a requirement of the community preservation process is that this board um, sign off on those applications. My understanding is that a final CPC application is due on October 13th, which is next Friday, and uh, therefore uh, the board has to take these up tonight. To the extent that the board does not vote on these items tonight, the proponents will not be able to submit an application and they would not be taken up this year. So I just wanted to clarify procedure and timing for the benefit of my colleagues in the audience. Um, I'm also just going to note that this is not a full-blown community preservation hearing. We know that there's a very long, very rigorous process, and we also know that we have um, our fellow committee members, the members of the Community Preservation Committee, are going to take the time. So uh, we want to have enough discussion to give us a flavor for the decision we have at hand but not impede on the Community Preservation Committee's very important work. Um, so the first project is, our, uh, is what's called Improvements to Building 52 and Building 112 located at 48 Bear Cove Park Drive. This was a project where we received you know, packages of information. Um, Jerry, is this something that you want to come up and speak to? Yes. Thank you. And Jerry, I think most people know you, but if you wouldn't mind just um, giving your name and address for the benefit of the audience. I am really Geraldine Duff, <laughs> 37 Bradley Park Drive. And we have two addresses here, by the way. Uh, building 52 is uh, 48 Bear Cove Park Drive. Building 112 is 45 Bear Cove Park Thank Drive. You. Jerry, could you just, um, you've given us an application. We've had an opportunity to review it. Could you kind of give the headlines of what this proposed project entails? Well, it's in two parts. Uh, the Building 52 at 48 Bear Cove Park Drive, we want to make the appearance of the old warehouse the way it used to be in the 1920s and 40s. With that in mind, we're not going to open up the windows. We'd like to put the blast shutters on them so they look like they were there originally. We want to clean up the loading platform, make it handicapped accessible, and, re and, re and ins replace the pedestrian door that was in the center. And uh, that's the base, basic part of the project. Um, wiser people than I know all those little details. With building um, 112, the museum proper, over the years we have developed a wonderful collection as the men worked on the trucks, people would come in and donate all their materials that related to the Hingham Fire Department. We're finding that the storage area that we have for them is not airtight, and when they start the trucks, 
the exhaust goes into that room, which is damaging the papers and photographs. Thank you. And Jerry, I, I recall, and I, I can't remember how many years ago it was, but the Community Preservation Committee and town meeting ultimately approved it was about $75,000 for the roof of Building 112? Yes, and that has been done. Yep, and that work was done. And that was, what I, see, what I remember was that that was to, um, to, protect, to protect everything that was inside of, of, of the building. Remove the asbestos and put down a roof that didn't leak. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's it. Because in Building 112, it is our maintenance facility and support in that we, t we do the messy work when it comes to working on these vehicles. Right now we're in the process of restoring a 1938 Ford Maxim forest wagon, the first one that Hingham had. And we have, it's in process, it's messy, and I go, don't go near it. But we also have other pieces within the building that are scheduled for restoration. We have two 1940 Seagraves, one's a ladder, one's a pumper. We have um, a Mac, you know, it's just, they're all hanging pieces. That's all we work on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what 112 is for. Thank you. Um, questions from my colleagues? I don't, I don't have any questions. I'll have a comment at the appropriate moment. Karen? Yeah, I guess I'm still trying to get my arms around the project a little bit. I think I, I, think I understand the, the improvements to Building 52. Um, and so, so first let me back up. So I had the opportunity this spring to be at the fire museum on a couple of different occasions and um, really the, the fire memorabilia is, is fascinating. Um, so in that room that I toured around where all the memorabilia is, does that stay put or is that all gonna move to building 112? No, no, okay. no, the building that the, we're having the storage problems is this on the second floor okay were you on the second floor I no I didn't go up there no because what you were in was our display area which yep. we rotate out okay and, and and the display area isn't affected by the no we have a nice tight seal between between the two between rooms. that like garage yes. area where <laughs> yeah. okay okay and the upstairs okay um, you know I, I guess one of the things I'm struggling with particularly with respect to the 112 request is just um, I know that we have other archival uh, sites around town you know for instance you know I'm wondering sort of about the capacity of the Heritage Museum you know I know the library has archival um, archival storage areas I know some I know we have documents at Town Hall that we've had to to archive so I'm just wondering you know I, I'm wondering about the capability of kind of using what we already have you know what's the I guess what's the volume of the material that you're looking to store and have you have you explored the well, the thing is, a lot of the materials we have refer back to the trucks, so we need them on hand for when there's a question on servicing them. We have the complete service manuals for the Seagraves that uh, uh, Mayor Hedlund's family gave us and things like that. The people that have given us the stuff gave it to the Fire Museum, which is a separate entity from the town, even though we do have all town materials. We have a stipulation in our bylaws, should we no longer be able to do this, everything goes to the Historical Society with $20,000 to help them maintain it. Okay. Um, so again, some sense of the volume of the stuff you're talking we about? We have, um, well, the other thing too is, everything I have relates to firefighting and the Historical Society and the Fire Museum have been giving each other certain items like, this is historical, you take it, we take the fire stuff. Because back in 83, they gave us one of their fire collections because they didn't have room for it. And I don't think they're ever going to have room for it because they've been finding stuff that's incredible. Yeah. And um, so my thought was maybe, we, we, we're working in steps here too. We're, we, we come up with these projects, we, do, we finish a project, we go on to the next one. Further down the line, we hope to be able to use Building 112 for a display museum for the ammunition depot that Scotty McMillan has been working on. Okay, and um, you know, forgive me because I, mm -hmm. I probably should know the answer to this question, but you lease Building 52 and 112 from the town, or how, we, what's that relationship? We have a concession agreement. Okay. We've had a concession agreement since 1981. Um, in the early years, the, they would, um, you would just say, go ahead, you can use the building, fix it up the way you want. And now we have, I think the agreement comes up for review in 2020. Yeah, okay. that's what I was And then, about. 
there's, we don't ask you for any money from the town itself. We're just um, <coughs> day to day basis. We can cover our costs. But what we're looking for is this little extra to preserve the paperwork and the document, you know, the photographs. Yeah. Um, and how about are there um, are there state grants like in addition to CPC funds? Um, you know, are there private donations? Are there state grants? Are there federal grants? You know, how how else? I is don't know. I don't know. I haven't looked into it. Okay. But Alexander Rollins from the Historical Society said she'd walk me through some of those. Okay. Jerry and. Um, I think one of the things I've been trying to get my arms around with, with this project um, is sort of what's the long-term vision for, you know, when, when the work is completed. And I know the work is, is never completed, but, you know, what kind of what's the long-term vision for these buildings and the fire museum? Because, you know, when, when the application, I remember kind of when the application came with the roof, I sort of thought the way you were describing it was kind of one project. Now that I've gotten this, it seems like there's it, this is a bigger effort. And I'm just trying to get my arms around what's the end state. The end state is to be a professional museum and provide research materials for those in that are researching genealogy because we have a lot of firefighters. We have a lot of records of the men that were in the service and women now. and. We, pro we, we get a lot of people from across the country and the world, we had New Zealand in last year, um, come in and ask questions and we help them find the materials they're looking for. And it's just one more step in that history search that people are doing. Mm -hmm. Plus, we have some stuff you are never going to see again. We have a piece of leather hose, which the, one of the Boston historians told me he has never seen. Mm -hmm. So we have pieces that families in Hingham have saved for years and now they're coming out of the woodwork so everybody can see them. Mm -hmm. I think there's a collection of about 300 badges, yeah. including my grandfather's. And so anyone can come in and say, I want to see Grandpa's badge. And, we, and the, the storeroom for the archives, we will be have to, because the stairs are substandard, we'll have to send someone up, okay, we're going to go up and get what you need, bring it down, and you can do it in the, in the uh, display room. We'll have a table set up. We have a computer with the museum program so that makes searching a lot easier. So I can say, oh yeah, what you want is in box 20 on shelf nine. Because I think one of the other, and, and the reason I'm asking is that it's been my experience sometimes with CPC projects that we start down the road and projects are getting funded for in four and five different CPC funding cycles. And, um, uh, you know, so once you kind of start going with it, it's it's hard to stop with it. And I'm mindful that with the Heritage Museum and the Laner property, the amount of CPC dollars you know that we have to work with are, are lower. So um, it, to me, as I'm thinking about this, I'm trying to think about sort of where does this fit in the bigger plan, and might there be additional requests? And I'm I'm sort of feeling like I have a lot of a lot of questions that. Um, uh, more questions than answers, particularly on sort of where, where some of this is headed. Um, yeah, sort of what's the plan and what's the, yeah, what's the longer term? The long term plan. And then, and then what's the, you know, in addition to CPC, you know, what are the un other funding sources that we can identify? Because I just don't think, if, if, the, if the long term goal is a professional museum, we're not going to get there with just CPC dollars. We're going to need, which know. is why I had gone to the Historical Society for help in guiding us through that. Right, right. Yeah. I'm, I'm also. I, I, I don't know enough about the national parks restrictions that accompany the buildings and the land over <coughs> in that area. But you know, a, a, another question that that I would have would be related to whether advancing this in any way has any adverse consequences on the, that, that whole agreement, which I'll, I'll be the first to say, I don't know enough about it to say. Um, I, I think what, what I'm kind of feeling like is that if, you know, if we had a little bit more time to get some of, the, some of these questions answered, I'd, I'd feel better about advancing it, because I feel like if we're 
advancing it, we're saying we think this is a project not necessarily that should be approved, but that has merit for consideration for these very scarce funds. And um, I feel like I have a lot, a lot of <clears throat> questions that I don't think can be answered between now and, and the application deadline. Well, the, the property was turned over to, to us, as my understanding, from the Department of the Interior. And there's a res restriction on that segment of land, and it has to be used for educational purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's the only restriction I'm aware yeah. of at this time. Yeah. And again, like, you know, normally if we would get something like this, we'd ask council to take a look at all that because council helps us, council helps us do that. I'd like to comment. Please. Um, I think it might be helpful to visit the history of how the uh, Bear Cove Fire Museum came to, to be. Um, I have first-hand knowledge of that by virtue of working up at Charlie Cushions as a kid. And I remember when Charlie Cushion and Lloyd Linscott came up from Seekonk uh, with an old rusty truck um, that was lovingly restored, all volunteer work, ladder one. And um, since that time, we've, we've had the pleasure um, of seeing that truck in the parade um, we've seen the Aaron's Fox, which is a magnificent fire machine. Um, you know, that, that is my personal favorite. And, you know, at first the, the equipment was at Charlie's Garage, and then it ended up at the Hersey Barn down on Hersey Street, and it's, it's eventually moved to this place. And I think that this, um, this part of our town's history is, is really special. I'm, you know, I'm not a firefighter. Um, but I have a great deal of respect for the culture of, you know, the firefighter mission because, um, you know, it, until very recently it was all volunteers, you know, and they were, you know, the, the fire horn up at Central Fire would go off and, you know, I, I still have the card with the different, you know, horn sounds to yeah. tell you where to go. Um, and I... As, as a teenager and as a young man, I saw the response of the community, people bringing in these historic relics of the firefighting mission. Um, there's so many people, uh, the townies and the Hingamites of this town, uh, trace their roots back, um, you know, serving on, on Hingham Fire. So it's with a great deal of pride. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the fact that we have these pieces um, that have been lovingly restored with a great deal of time, all by volunteers, is something that I personally take a great deal of pride in because I don't, I don't know of any other town in, that I can think of that has something like this. Um, and, and the fact that it's coupled with, you know, using, you know, an old World War I warehouse um, just kind of, to me, adds to the, the flavor of it all. Um, you know, it, it, they're looking for 150 grand. Um, yeah, it's it's not jump change, that's for sure. But um, I look at the bigger value that this brings. Um, I know that the work and the time that the men and women in the Beaco Fire Museum have put into restoring these machines uh, far exceeds anything that we're contemplating. I mean, just thousands of hours and. You know, we all enjoy it, um, you know, on the 4th of July, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there are people that go down there, and you know, they go in, and it, it, it's, it, to me, this is something that is, is a plus for the town. This is just another one of those things that makes the town special and, and distinct. So um, that's where I'm coming from on this. Yeah, that's, you. you know, I... I've seen it evolve from just, you know, trying to, you know, figure out how to loosen up that rusted nut and just make it all work and just so much, you know, literally love of the mission went into restoring those trucks. Um, I, it's, it's my inclination to be supportive of whatever they're trying to do. Okay, thank you. That's where I'm coming from. I, you know, I, I, I 
like I said, I got an opportunity to be down there this spring and get a little taste of what you're conveying to us tonight. Um, the one thing I got to say is that um, with every dollar that comes before us that we spend, we like to be in a position to get all our questions answered. And I sort of feel like backed up against the wall a little bit on this. So, you know, like Mary, I, I have some, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with anything Paul said. And I also believe that we're a special town because of the efforts of the volunteers that in particular have um, created this museum piece. Um, we were in, uh, Jim and I were actually in Italy recently and there's a private museum there in the Dolomites that collects World War I memorabilia. And it's, it's a fully, fully private museum that was extraordinary. Um, so it really is the efforts of all of us to preserve our legacy that makes us who we are and reminds us who we are, right? But, um, you know, I, like I said, I, I'd like to be able to sort of look through this stuff, have some time to ask some questions, and get those questions answered. And I just, um, it, you know, I, I just don't feel like I'm there. Um, and I, I think it's sort of it's a shame that we've got to give it a thumbs up, thumbs down on this basis. You know, this is the, you know, I, I, we got the application a little bit earlier this week, and. Um, you know, I, I realize it's not a, a huge lift, but within the CPC budget, it's significant. So, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, for, first of all, I, and even though it's not a huge piece of this, I, I really can't support the $25,000 for the archives because I think we need to do a little bit more work on what other resources exist in town. Um, the concern I have about improvements to the building is just, again, the longer-term vision for for that area um, and making sure that whatever use those buildings are put to, you know, that, that, that this would comport with future use beyond, you know, beyond 2020, because the useful life of these improvements would extend beyond 2020. So, I mean, I, I guess if, if you want to, if you're inclined to support um, the improvements to the building, I, I could go along with that, but I, I really, I have too many questions on the archival piece um, to vote on that tonight. Um, I guess I just put it to you, Jerry. Would, would you rather step this back and wait, or would you like to go forward on what you think you can get? Well, I don't want to be taking a vote that's anti. No, it is a hard because you're working with a budget. Um, if it was me s s sitting here by myself, I would say the archives all the way. but. The men are out there, they're doing the work, they're getting in and out of the building, they've got to, they want people to come in to be able to do the work safely. This, the, the land, the, uh, what is it called, loading dock area is crumbling and we really need to have um, proper access. We only have the one door to go in and out, the other, the other two are overheads and they don't count. So I would say go with building 112. Probably not up to fire code. No, it isn't. But it was a warehouse for ammunition, and it never and it never blew up. <laughs> and listen, the reason, the only reason I no, you're the right. The reason I can't support the archive piece is because I I have some additional questions about where else we might be able to get a, the best bang yeah. for our buck for that. Now, understanding that you you have some on-site yeah. requirements for those documents, but you know, before we spend twenty five thousand dollars, are there other other solutions? Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I just want to pause for a second and ask if there's anyone in the audience who wants to comment on this because I think we should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Carol, the total amount is. Uh, the total amount is. 129,200. Uh, no, 149,500. Yeah. Yes. So it's twenty five thousand yeah. for the archive. Yeah. One hundred fifty ish. Yeah. I, um, I agree with everything that my colleagues have said, and I think one of the things that makes Hingham so special is that we have volunteers who just contribute so many of their own hours to um, 
to things that that are that they feel passionate about that really just add to our community and you know Jerry you're you know right at the top you're of the list of people of, that, right? of, of people who do that of people who do that um, I'm kind of like Karen where I have more questions about you know when when the roof went through when I was on advisory it was a roof now it's being referred to as phase one and this is phase two which leads me to wonder is there a phase three and phase four and I think for me I would want to see kind of the whole picture before doing it um, and I think that would strengthen your application process and the town meeting process um, because I think one of the responsibilities we also have is to um, be able to put our best foot forward to the community I'm also conscious that I think a lot of the answers to these questions are going to require a lot of time including from some of our town staff and as we're getting into budget season and things you know the, the, the best time for town staff to do a lot of this work is is kind of before the fall when there are there are fewer competing demands so I'm, I'm also conscious of the time it will take to get those answers um, you know my preference and we're all gonna we're all gonna vote on this so you know my preference would be that um, that we hold this for a year and that you take the time to help us paint the picture of what's the end state we would have the ability to look into the national park information any other legal considerations a question I have is if we're investing that much money into a building does it trigger other things that That's that we're unaware of um, you know we we had the situation of Plymouth River and Foster where you know the book value of the assets um, when the improvements were made a, a number of other ADA and other things kicked in I just feel like we have to kind of have all the ants all the the information to know what we're getting into um, because I think the only thing what what I think would be a shame is that we go down this road with the fire museum and we can't finish the work I, I think that would be like really super disruptive so um, so so I guess one question is is phase two in and of itself let's assume we don't spend another dollar at the fire museum is phase two in and of itself worth doing you know does that does that get you to let, again let's assume that's the end of this show like and all you get is phase two if all I get is phase two on building one one two I mean on 52 yeah on 52 we can still go forward with all our volunteers I think if you show us interest and support in building um, 52 then that'll encourage more people to step forward and give us of their expertise so part of it may be as, as uncomfortable as we may be part of it may be that um, we would we could write down and forward some of these questions as, as part of the CPC analysis maybe yeah, I mean, if, the CPC we, process hasn't really even begun, so, uh, you know, uh, the CPC kicks the tires on all the applications, you know, much more thoroughly than we're so, doing. So, for instance, to your point, um, if we spend this much money and make these this level of improvement and it were to trigger ADA requirements that would require money on top of that, is that something that the CPC would do before it would make this grant? Would it? I would imagine. I mean, I think CPC is going to be asking a lot of those same, same questions. Because I, I certainly don't want to get mired in that. Yep. Um, would either of my colleagues like to make a motion? Um, sure. Uh, I move that we vote to approve the request um, by the Bear Cove Fire Museum with respect to the. Uh, Items one and two in the phase two building 2017-2018 um, proposal on um, building 52. So I get a total of 124,500. Is that right? That looks like 124,500. Okay. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very sure. much. Mary, in that process, I'll, um, I'll reach out to the three of you about any questions you have and make sure the CPC okay. is given those questions. That sounds great. Thank you. Now, I think because of this, you have to issue an affidavit of approval. I, I believe that's yes. right, Jerry. Yes. Okay. And, Thank and you. And so with, with this vote tonight, the board will make sure that that is, 
that that is done in sufficient time for um, for it to accompany the application. Excellent. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much. And I appreciate your your input and your hard work. Well, and Thank and you, um, you know, it's let, let's keep <laughs> well, and let's let's keep on the table the investigation of the archives. Oh I mean, yeah. I'm not. That's not going to stop. Okay. That's my baby. Okay. okay. Um, Bye, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. The next item on the agenda is um, improvements to the Memorial Bell Tower. And is there someone? Yes, please. Sir, if you wouldn't mind, because the microphone, then that way, um, people watching the meeting, if you could please um, identify yourself and describe the CPC project, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Michael. Michael Schillen, 124 Levitt Street. Um, I'm going to try to be really brief tonight. Uh, some 10 years ago, we started on a a process of restoring or working on the bell tower, which led to a a, um, a rather major effort to redo the building itself. And that was all completed at some cost of $200,000 uh, about eight years ago, nine years ago, something like that. I don't know. But anyways, uh, and there was, at that time, um, the, the CPC had more or less agreed that there would be follow-up work on the bells themselves. And that's where we are right now. And um, we had a number of proposals from um, uh, uh, the Whitechapel Bell Foundry in, in England, which is now no longer in business after 500 years, but it's a long <laughs> story. But anyways, uh, and they had a number of proposals ranging from, mm, this was eight years ago, nine years ago, 150000 to 300000 and we had to pay the local cost, so you're talking about way more money than that. And, uh, and there were some other things that, uh, that were involved in this. Uh, the bell ringers who have been active in the town for a long time, we talked about this and talked about this, and we decided this kind of doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's just too much money. And, and we didn't think, I wouldn't feel comfortable for asking for that kind of money. And so after all these years, now we have decided that we would like to uh, work on a couple bells at a time. And I would tell you right up front that yes, we'll be back again, because there's a, these two bells now, which are particularly hard to ring, and then there's uh, a couple more bells that I'd like to ring on, uh, like to have done, but we're not in total agreement as to how many how many bells need to be worked on, and um, uh, and then the um, we have now a new uh, source of, um, of of a company that can work on this, and that is a a U.S. based. Bell Foundry in Virginia, the first one that, uh, that I'm aware of. And they came through with a proposal to work on two of the bells that we wanted to work on. I was particularly impressed with, with, with their proposal. Uh, but they're a bit of an unknown quantity to us, but that's, that's the nature of bell ring. I mean, I've mean, changed bell ringing, and I don't want to get into that unless you really want to talk about that. But anyways, uh, uh, so um, so we have, we now have scaled all of this back to working on a couple bells at a time, and uh, and then in the future, they've come up with an interesting proposal to. Uh, to to restructure the frame in the in the bell tower, which will allow five bells on top of five bells, and uh, and I'm kind of impressed with that little idea too. But anyway, so I'm I'm completely impressed with uh, with uh, this the outfit is Sunderland and Belfry, but you have I'm mm -hmm. sure you have all that kind yes. of stuff. So uh, I guess that's basically where we are. We'd like to do two bells and and see how it works now. Uh, I just heard this long discussion about how important is the bell tower and ringing bells to the town of Hingham. Uh, geez, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it, you know, it's a, uh, 
It's a historic structure. Uh, we're actually stuck with it because we have a, a, a historic restriction on it from the state because we took state money to do some work on the tower and so on and so forth. So the tower is there, I mean, and we do get, uh, uh, we get ringers from uh, most of the, uh, exclusively from the English speaking world that, that come over and ring the tower, uh, ring in the tower. and. So on and so forth. And Sarah, you uh, you want to add anything to that little bit, right? <laughs> anyway, so that's where we are. We're, we're, we 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 just tried to bring all this sure. back to a a manageable amount of money. And, yep. and but I guarantee you, right off the bat, yes, we will ask for some more money in yep. in the future. Well, and, uh, yeah, that's that's helpful to know. I I remember yeah. when um, Karen and I were on advisory, we. Many of us offered to accompany the Bells over to England for repair, yeah. um, which is a tough job, but someone has oh, well, to we, do it. We, uh, it. we completely rejected the notion of ever <laughs> taking the Bells out of the tower because it would be just too costly, <laughs> too invasive, and it would put us out of business for years. You may, know? may I just and, ask uh, a question? And I don't, I don't know if, I, I know Andrea Young is, is in the audience, so I, I don't know who's best able to answer the question. but. I remember several years ago when I was on the advisory committee, um, I, I think it was $150,000 was appropriated for town meeting, which was not only for the tower, but my understanding was that was beginning some of the work on the bells. No. no. Okay, so no, no. so it was purely. It did not conclude. It was any purely work structural. On, other than the fact that when they got all done, because they put new floors in, we had to bring a bell hanger from England who had to drill new holes in the floors to bring the ropes down. Thank you, okay. And that, and that was the only thing they got done on the bells. That, thank you, that was, thank you for the clarification. So mm. none of the bells have gone undergone any restoration at this point? What's that? No. Not, they, they have not gone, undergone any restoration at this point. No. And what, well, basically what we're doing, we're taking two bells, uh, what we, <laughs> This was the whole idea 10 years ago. We went to put put the bells on ball bearings. They are on old Babbitt bearings, 100 years old, and it makes the bells very difficult to ring. Now, there are some English ringers come over and they don't seem to have any trouble, but Sarah was mentioning the other day that there was an English ringer here and a quite good, and she, she just quit ringing the bell, right? Because it was so hard to ring, and uh, so we we just we want to take the two worst bells and try to do something with them. Yeah. And those and the two that you want to do are no longer serviceable. Uh, right okay, I mean, can you ring them? Right. I think well, in the materials we got, it said that you really uh, can't I, ring them. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You you have to be. Uh, one of the bells that we want to redo, I used to ring all the time, but that was 20 years ago. I can't do it anymore. So it's okay. just too, Thank takes you. too much physical strength to, to ring it. Yeah. But we have ring, there's one right sitting right there who can ring that bell, you know. And, uh, but you, it takes younger men uh, of strength to ring some of these bells. Um, and also, uh, the easier, you know, we're always uh, trying to expand our number of bell ringers and uh, and we have a problem there because the easier the bells are to ring, it, the more success you have in teaching a new ringer. It's really tough to teach new ringers on hard bells, sure. you know. And uh, you know, you. As, as I say, how important is bell ringing to the town of Hingham? I have no idea. Other than <laughs> it, it kind of falls in the same care as the, 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 the Bear Cove Fire Museum or lots of other things that it make, does. make yeah, Hingham special. Right. Just one of those no, little. Um, you know, a lot of this is 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 sort of you know what's what's part of the fabric of Hingham, it's right? Part of, and it is a, it is a memorial tower. It was dedicated sure. to the settlers of Hingham. It's over 100 years old. It was it was the idea of Reverend Cornish at the Old Ship Church many years ago, and. Uh, sure. uh, but the town, in their infinite wisdom, decided to take on financial responsibility for this about 25 years or 30 years ago or something like that. <coughs> Paul or Karen, do you have any questions? Just a comment. Please. Um, I can tell you, sir, that I've enjoyed hearing those bells for over half a century. Okay. And, you know, it's Tuesday night, and I always look forward to hearing them. Uh-oh, uh, we bring on Saturday mornings now. Though. Yeah, no, I hear you there, too, but I'm usually working, so I'm distracted a little bit. But, you know, to me, it's, 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 a, great, uh, it's a great sound to have echoing through the square. Mm. 
um, and it and again it's it's one of those things that really makes the town what it is um, now you, you can look a little farther down the road if you you know and again it's a little more money but the whole notion of uh, uh, electronic chiming has always been a part of this yeah. thing. So you you put a mechanism in there so the, well the bells can be can be rung electronically so that at noon or at one o'clock or two o'clock you can ring uh, and all that kind of stuff. Well, but that, that that's another fifteen thousand dollars or something like yeah. that. Something like that. Yeah, I think as long as we have good people that are willing to step forward to do this kind of thing, you know, I have a child when she lived in England, she found a bell tower where they did that oh, and she really? enjoyed doing it. I tried to drag her <laughs> to your undertaking, but no luck. Um, you know, we spent we spent a no, lot of money on the not, tower. It's a kind of kind of makes it's sense it's that we <laughs> work on the bells too. That's an esoteric thing to do. I understand that. You know. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, thank you all for doing that, yeah. though. Seriously, uh, I really enjoy that. Just thank you. Well, just thank you for really, saying really that. do. I'm sure I'm sure everybody in the area loves hearing it. I have no doubt in my mind. Yeah, so my question, I guess, follows up on Paul's comment, which is the tower itself is structurally secure. Uh, so that's well, that that does come. We that's what what the whole last phase was about, and that question question does come up from time to time. And we are going to get uh, the engineers who did the tower right to come back up and look at it. But we personally don't see any. Looks like it's built. Uh, degradation of there's no cracks in the brick walls or anything like that and also the other thing is we we um, one of the issues that came up is ringing the big bells the 10 and 9 uh, uh, those are the heaviest bells when I say the big bells is the heavy ones. we don't ring them very often they may only get rung four or five times a year or something like that so uh, and the other thing about the structure of the tower is um, um, Sunderland again if this all works out uh, has an idea to re rehang the bells uh, two tiers move them in from the walls and then rig them so that when they are rung the forces of the bells ringing uh, pull in opposite yeah, yeah, directions yeah. to take the load off the tower yeah. I think that's rather intriguing yeah, okay. but anyways. Yeah. Um, well but that's that's not part of this yeah, all this okay. is is to take two of the bells sure. we ring all the time and just make them a little easier. To, well, Thank hopefully you. a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you. Did you have something else? No, I, I just thought it was a well-constructed uh, yeah. application as well. Yeah. What's that? So I think the application was very well done. Yeah. It's, oh, um, oh. you know, uh, you, yeah, for Sarah, me. Sarah, Sarah did that application. Right? Um, you know, every, every CPA application that comes before the town or for the board is worthy. Uh, every single one of them is and that's what makes it hard because there are only limited funds mm -hmm. and we have some of those funds committed to other projects and also the state reimbursement and the state matching kind of declines every year I think it's 19 cent I think it's 19 cents on the dollar right now it's it's very small so it's it's very hard you know what's um, uh, while I live as I live very far south in Hingham, um, but the idea that this goes on, even though I don't, my family doesn't get to enjoy the bells, the idea that this happens and it's, it's, volunteer, it's all volunteers, um, it's just one more reason to be proud of the community. In terms of the application, um, what, what's helpful to me is, you know, when you came in the first time, you said, we've got the tower and then we've got to do the bells. And now you're coming in saying, we're back with the bells. And we're going to do two bells, and there are eight more to go, and so this is coming. For me, what's very helpful well, in the there, CPC there, there application. May, may not, we're not in total agreement on that. Yeah. There may not be eight more. Well, there may not, but I, at least I personally think some of the least, bells ring fine as yeah. they are. So, uh, yeah, but we can get our fine. arms. We can get our, our arms around what the entire project is, which you know, it's to me, it's like you know, you, you don't start a project on your house until you're sure you have the money to kind of finish it. Yeah. And, and I think the dollar amount here, I'm, I'm sort of projecting that, you know, two bells might, again, be sort of $30,000. So for, for all those different reasons, um, I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in support of this. I sort of see my colleagues nodding. So if, 
if I may, I'd, I'd like to make a motion to allow the Memorial Bell Tower Committee to submit an application for community preservation funding for the restoration of two bell frames and their components. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 So again, our office will give the affidavit that's necessary. We'll make sure we do that in time for the application. Um, and uh, we thank everybody for coming in to, uh, um, to, to speak to the project. I Feel free to I stay must, for I must say in the end, though, that I understand where the CPC money is going, and uh, I think that's great, too. So I understand the, uh, the shortage of funds. I think uh, the Laner property you know, is a big bite, but, man, I would have voted for that any time, yeah. right? And, and well, and, you know, it, and it, the CPC, they, you know, and I, I see there's a member of the CPC in the audience. <laughs> that's not an easy job because every project is worthy. There are limited funds. We try to spread dollars around and help everybody out a little bit. And um, uh, we'll look forward to hearing the CPC recommendations. They'll come back to us sometime in January, I believe. Good. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Thanks thank you. Here. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, Ken, thank you for waiting. Security camera procedures. Could you join us, please? Yeah, Chief. Mayor, do you mind if Chief Folsom joins us at the table? Please. Oh. Tom, do you want to just um, set a little context for this agenda item? Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, so several weeks ago we started conversations about um, installing video cameras on the harbor through some grant programs that um, Harbor Master Corson was able to, to obtain for the community, um, save us some money and get us some well-needed protections and uh, et cetera down at the harbor. That conversation prompted a series of questions that we wanted to make sure the board was comfortable with when it uh, as it relates to procedures and how the video and surveillance camera data is used and maintained and protected so uh, I've asked the chief and the harbor master to be available tonight to come in and talk to you uh, and try to answer any questions that may exist and um, hopefully put you at ease with uh, with our policies and procedures internally thank you um, Ken, thank you so much for preparing this document. We also appreciate that you got it to us in advance of the meeting. That helps us to be able to read through it. Um, so uh, appreciate that. Um, did you want to um, just kind of give us a couple of the highlights? And, and again, you know, so where do we have cameras in town? What are they used for? And you know what what are the some of the procedures that you've put in place to ensure that um, ensure that those cameras are not used or accessed for any any inappropriate reasons okay I can certainly do that I guess if I could start with just giving a little bit of background how yes. we got to where we are um, in May of 2014 um, the Harbor master's office submitted an application to the port security grant program that application was four hundred seventy four thousand dollars and um, later that year, we were granted the award. Um, the town matched that with a $50,000 match at the 2015 annual town meeting. And um, in May 12th of 2016, the Board of Selectmen signed um, the contract to go ahead with the installation. And the installations were completed before the beginning of 2017. Um, so that, that gave rise to what we have for the cameras at the harbor. Now, what are these cameras at the harbor? There's roughly um, 16 cameras that go from the Inner Harbor all the way to the Back River Bridge. Um, these cameras all communicate their, the information that they capture is all communicated back to a secured server through point-to-point -point, um, wireless antennas. So there's no fiber run around the town or anything like that. It's all these point-to-point -point antennas, which everything's secure and encrypted, so you can't just um, intercept the information from these these cameras. The information, like I said, is stored on, stored on a server. And in order to to view a live camera or see any of the information that's been recorded, you have to have a user credential and a password. So, in order to get on there, you have to be given a user credential and you have to have a password that's unique to you that allows you to get on there and see what you're allowed to see. Um, there's very few people that have access to this right now. Um, like I said, those people have these user credential and passwords, and they understand um, 
policies and procedures and what the law restricts us and allows us to do and how to do that. So of these people that have access to it, some are only allowed to see a live feed and then fewer of them are allowed to actually go back and see previously recorded information. Um, typically we only go back and see previously recorded information if there was an incident and we, when we have the ability to have these up on a monitor and view them when we're working, um, it's not something you look at all the time and watch. It's something you may glance up if there's something that you know you notice that you should be concerned or, or want to look at more, you might investigate a little bit further. But of all the information that we gather, I'd say conservatively we see less than 1%. Or yeah, it's very conservative. We probably see a lot less than that. Um, we don't have the ability or the time to go back and watch everything. So really the only time we go back and watch is if there was an incident or a situation. Um, the information is um, retained for 30 days. Um, there's no audio recording. There's no capability of audio recording. Um, and I guess there's two benefits that, this pro that I see that this provides our community. Um, it helps to protect our citizens and their property. Um, when we have boats that are vandalized or stolen or taken to joy rights, um, prior to having this camera system, the owners would always say, well, don't you have a camera? You know, you can get them at, at Home Depot for, for a short money. You could just put a camera up there and you might be able to gather something. So um, we've traditionally never had that. Now we have that capability of <coughs> a stolen boat or vandalism to hopefully gather some information on that. Um, something else that's very helpful that often I think gets overlooked is the, uh, the ability to enhance situational and domain awareness and allocation of resources. So what this means is if we get a call that a boat's sinking or taking water on and we have a camera that we can articulate to see that area, before we even get in the boat or start going there, we're able to see very quickly, is the boat above the water? Is it sinking? Are there people in the water? If, you had a, if we had a fire call you were able to, and we were able to articulate a camera, you could see is there a boat on fire or is it just smoke. Not that it's going to slow our response down, but at least we have a better idea what it is we're going to be arriving on scene with. And then there's the ancillary uses too, which are the ability to mo monitor weather conditions, town infrastructure like town pier during a storm, the town boats. Um, so it gives us another ability there, which we've previously not had. So I think that's, I guess that's kind of the presentation I have. And then, you. you know, obviously myself and the chief can take any additional questions you might have. I would add that an additional benefit that I think helps Ken and his team do their job is it helps you pinpoint a location. Um, I'm struck as a boater at how many times people radio for help and they can't give their longitude and latitude that they typically use the land as a point of reference. So I'm right off such and such a point or you know, I can see such and such a building. Um, so it, it's, it seems to me that by, by using those cameras to scan, um, you can pinpoint locations um, and have resources on hand quicker in some cases. I, I would also add that <clears throat> it seems like lately we've been seeing a lot of incidents regarding kayakers. Um, you read about on the news that a kayaker went out, they found a, they found a kayak, it drifted up the shore. No one knows anything except they found a kayak. So it sort of results in the fact that obviously we believe that there's probably somebody that was originally in the kayak. With something like this, you, you could actually go back through the camera system and actually maybe identify whether this just broke loose, whether it you know, fell off of somebody's car, or some kids pushed it in the water, or there was actually a person in it. So involving a lot of incidents where it involves public safety it's huge to find that information out as fast as you can because we've seen these searches and I, I think there's been two or three of them this summer where these, this has actually happened um, that you could really pinpoint down we could find who it probably is we're looking for you might be able to trace it back to the unloading or the launching and then you would be able to confirm that somebody was in it so it's, it's really a valuable tool as far as that and also uh, during our recent hurricane Mm -hmm. um, they were also using it in their office to sort of keep an eye for any boats that broke loose. Um, you had five boats break, was it? Yeah, we had roughly five boats that um, either broke loose or sustained damage 
we actually had one that, that broke off its mooring, went up against a pier. Um, we were able to get it off the pier under tow, and then under its own power came back to the shipyard. We were able to watch it for most of its journey on its own power, make sure they didn't have any situations, and then as they came into the river, we knew that they were arriving and we could meet them at the dock to assist them. So the benefits are, I think, are tremendous. Um, with that said, I don't want you to think that we have a picture of every part of the harbor because it's just not possible Certainly. with 16 cameras. I mean, there's an awful lot we don't see, um, but we've articulated them in a way that we're really watching the channels, the area where there's a lot of boating traffic. So we're not necessarily looking at the mooring areas or, or things like that. We're looking at the channels, which you could think of as a roadway, where the boats would leave the harbor or come into the harbor. Thank you. Paul or Karen, any, any additional questions for Ken? I have a couple. Um, Ken, yeah. with respect to the retention policy, uh, would it be fair to say that um, if there is an event that triggers a, uh, a law enforcement response, the, the video will be preserved until the conclusion of the uh, action? That's correct, yep. And in terms of the technology of the camera, can it detect images at night in the dark? So um, we do have three thermal cameras, which are designed um, for low-level nighttime viewing. It doesn't give you quite a daylight view, but it's very similar to that. Um, for instance, we have one of these in the Inner Harbor, so if we had, say, um, a rowboat or a rowing shell that was coming in and it was getting dark and it, let's say, if it capsized or something, like that, we'd actually be able to see the number of people in the water. Um, so we do, so they do have that capability. The other um, cameras that are not thermal do have the ability to use ambient light to um, enhance the viewing capability in the dark. Um, well, Ken, thanks, and Chief, thank you. Um, you know, I, I raised a few questions a few months ago when the, the uh, camera uh, uh, vote came before us, and, um, you know, while I certainly appreciated the, the public safety and law enforcement aspect of the use of the cameras, I also wanted to be sure that when we're collecting imagery of, of potentially citizens of the town that I understood how that information was going to be used and stored and accessed. And, uh, you know, uh, Ken spent some time with me earlier this week to sort of take me through it in, in uh, greater detail, so I appreciate that time and appreciate you developing the, this policy. Um, I had a question following up on Paul's 30-day uh, retention period. So unless there's some incident that would um, require you to retain, you know, cer certain segments of the video, it's sort of on an automatic 30-day purge, so it just... Exactly. It'll start to re-record over unless there's some reason, um, whether it be Homeland Security reason or law enforcement, public safety, unless we, we go ahead and preserve... You have to go in there exactly, and... Exactly. We have to okay. go and preserve it. If we don't do that, it's automatically going to record over. Okay. And then um, uh, th this policy mentions signage. You and I talked about signage. Um, you know, I I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I, I just want people to be aware, I, I guess, that in, in situations where you might expect some degree of privacy, I, I just want people to be aware that, you know, video cameras are in use. And I had asked, I don't know whether there's any sort of state law requirement uh, on that front. I've certainly been in other locations where it, it will say something like you have in the policy that for your safety this area is under video surveillance. Um, so I was wondering if if that was part of your intention with yeah, this. Yeah, we, we most certainly can put up a couple signs. Um, um, that was in included in this policy prior to your even um, bringing it up because I know it's something that people may want to see. Um, and if you'd like to see some signs, I have no issue with putting up some signs, unless the chief has a different view. Yeah, I mean, maybe you, you can work that out. But I guess, yeah. you know, as you and I discussed, it may actually put people on their best behavior if they know they're... Well, yeah, I, I think in some of the studies that I've seen regarding the usage of um, video cameras as far as crime prevention tools, um, it really does no good if no one knows they're there. Um, so the problem is that, that just say for Hingham Harbor. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I don't really want to have them in a situation, in an area that they're actually going to pinpoint no, right. necessarily no. where the camera is. Right. But right. if you're driving in the parking lot, there could be a sign there that says this area right. is right. monitored. 
or right. something like that. I think that's that's great. As a matter of fact, I, I would sort of like that in every single pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and, and hopefully they'll just and believe maybe they'll guess, camera right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. These yeah, cameras yeah. are by no means covert. If you just took a ride by the harbor, you will very easily identify most likely where they are. They're not a covert camera by any means. So if you were just there with your eyes open, you're most likely going to, to see them. Okay. Are they stationary? Um, some are stationary and some have the ability to pan, tilt, and zoom. Um, and then last but not least, um, I think at some point we owe you a vote on our participation in the um, uh, linking in with the Coast Guard coastal camera program. And I just want to be, I don't, I didn't see those policies and procedures in this package, but I, I just want to be clear about how, if there's any difference or if they'd be subject to, you know, since we're signing up, do they come under our, our local policy procedure? Again, I just want to understand how the data can be accessed and viewed and retained and all that sort of stuff. Okay. So in regards to that, um, just for the record, I have recused myself from discussing that in this forum because of my involvement with uh, obtaining the grant through the Massachusetts Our Masters Association and seeking the funding through the state legislature. So just an abundance of caution, um, I've recused myself, but at the next meeting, um, Joe Driscoll, yep. the head assistant Our Master, will be able to, here to present that. Um, well, it should be helpful to me if, if that's part of his yeah. discussion. Yeah. 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 And, and, I, and I think my discussions on this with Ken and Joe have been that basically the same policies will be in place. And I think we understand that a society always has a fear of Big Brother. Right. And right. that would be us. Um, <laughs> you specifically, but no. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's over there. I think what I do feel comfortable saying um, in regards to the Massachusetts Harbor Masters Association camera project is the Mass Harbor Masters Association has no intention to tell any community what they can and can't do. Um, the goal of the organization was to provide a utility to communities that wanted to use it at a low-cost solution and the ability for them to network if they needed to build, have access to a camera in another community and also to allow the Coast Guard to come in in situations where the units are responding and they need information as to what they're getting themselves into. Yep. So I feel comfortable um, just commenting briefly there that the organization is not looking to tell any community what they can and can't do. Okay. And I'll just leave it, leave it at that. And but I, I think the rules and regulations of the Hingham Police Department uh, coincide with these because all the harbor masters fall into those as well. So if there's any misuse or anything like that, they'd be subject to termination. So I think, um, thank you, this is, this is very helpful. Um, and our next meeting is on the 24th, which is in, it's in about two weeks. And um, Ken, you were good enough to give this to us, you know, a few days in advance of the meeting. I might ask that if, if um, Assistant Harbor Master Driscoll could do the same thing with, with the decision for the board. Um, I think in addition to flagging whether there would be any policies or procedures that would be different than what we covered tonight, because my impression is that the board is comfortable with the policies and procedures in place, I think there was also an outstanding question about the costs Cost. associated with it, whether they would be under the grant, whether they would be sourced somewhere else. And, um, and so there were those two questions. What I might ask for Paul and Karen and, and I, and what we would commit is, if we get those materials from you, you know, four or five days before the meeting, um, I'd suggest that if there were any additional questions that we have prior to that, that we funnel those through Tom, who can then track those down so that, um, so that we can take the vote on the 24th if possible. Yep. Sounds good. I'll pass and that along to yeah. Joe Driscoll. Thank you both so much. Thank Thanks you. for coming in. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. See you again. Sure. Uh, next on the agenda is the financial forecast. And uh, Tom, did you want to ask Sue Nickerson to come up? Sure, and please. Sue, so come on up and join us. <laughs> <laughs> so at our uh, at our last meeting we had a little bit of discussion about the budget but mm -hmm. this is actually a copy of the five-year forecast that was reviewed with the uh, forecast group um, a couple of weeks ago so um, Tom and Sue if if you can take us through the headlines sure happy to 
So, as you know, this is a um, the, the forecast is a is a financial tool that the town uses as a preliminary document towards its budgeting effort every year. Um, to that end, we have to start somewhere. So this is the start. So what I'd like to do is walk you through uh, what we refer to as uses and sources or expenses and revenue, uh, et cetera. So I'll start with the uses. So there are a couple of subcategories. Uh, under uses, we have a million dollars in state assessments that we'll, we'll, we'll get each year uh, or this coming year. Uh, $350,000 of an overlay and $100,000 of other deficits and, or excuse me, other expenses and deficits for a subtotal of $1.45 million. Uh, other appropriations are going to be uh, $2.4 million or approximately so. Uh, that's an early estimate for the capital outlay program. And of course, the, large, the largest piece of, of the expenses for the town annually is Article 6 or the annual budget which at this moment is projected at $105,608,886. Articles 4 and 5, which cover additional, uh, additional contract uh, value for municipal employees at a projected 2% increase over FY18. We're looking at, for FY19, $786,471. For a again subtotal of this category of 108 million seven hundred ninety-five thousand three hundred and fifty-seven dollars, for a grand total of the planned total uses of 110 million two hundred fifty-two thousand seven hundred and fifty-nine dollars. Now, how are we going to pay for that? This is the sources side. Uh, the lion's share of this of the source to pay for those expenses comes from the tax levy, which is is anticipated that $76,514,475 plus a 2.5% increase per the allowable, um, allowable increase per law, uh, $1,912,862. We're anticipating new growth at approximately $1 million. Uh, debt exclusions to, uh, to total at $3,756,052. 3, with an anticipated uh, unused levy capacity of $500,000, bringing a total tax levy of $82,683,389. The other revenue that we see in town, this comes from sources outside of the, of the local tax levy, is state aid at 10 million, uh, just about $10.5 million. Local receipts anticipated that again, 2.5% increase at, to total at just over $9.7 million. We have the country clubs offset at two point, uh, just under $2.2 million. The sewer at $3.2 million. And the light plant uh, revenue coming in around $500,000. Uh, meals tax re uh, reserves will, will be at $450,000 with a stabilization fund um, anticipated currently at what it was last year of $178,836. Um, and that brings uh, the subtotal of that category is $26,852,106 with a total, uh, total uh, source or a total revenue anticipated at $109,535,495, which leaves us a grand total um, uh, deficit of $717,264. So all that said, we're in decent shape and compared to other years. We have a lot of work to do. The budget process has not yet started. Um, that process will, will flush out um, our needs uh, in more detail and our revenues in more detail. And uh, as always, and provided by law, we will end up with a balanced budget at the end of the process. Thank you. Paul, Karen, questions? Um, can you just give me a little color around the new growth? What, what what are we seeing? What what what's sort of in that million so dollar projection? In past years, we've we've anticipated approximately half a million dollars in new growth. This year, we're, we're anticipating a million dollars. This is a direct reflection of the three large developments up along Route Three A, um, specifically Avalon, Brio, and the Alliance project. And that comes from the building permit revenue. Building permits. That's right. Okay. And it's a portion of them there. It'll be spread out over the, uh, if you'll notice, FY 20's projection is also at a million dollars. That's the other half of the anticipated building permit revenue. Okay. 
And um, Article 6, the Article 6 projection of about $105 million, is that, um, is that looking at sort of a level funded budget? Like how did? Yes. What was the assumption there, level funded? It's, okay. I think it's 2%. It I think it's 2%. Two, well, oh. set, so salaries. Salaries. there's 2% so in salaries. Yeah. Well, expenses, percent of salaries uh, and expenses, and then I think in, in benefits, it's about a 10% 10, a 10 increase in benefits. Okay. So the 2% increase is built into the 105, the 105 million? Correct. Okay. Uh, the 105, Karen, is the expenses are, are forecasted at a 2% growth. Okay. Salaries are, are level funded, and the, the anticipated is Article 4 and 5. Okay. Okay. Yep. On the municipal side. On the municipal side. And then on side. the school side, it's 2% on salaries. On both. Right. Salaries and expenses. Okay. Sue, so you're going to have to bring me up to speed again <laughs> it's quite all right uh and for in general insurance the um, health insurance yep. we are predicting for right now a 10 percent increase okay um we're not sure exactly what's going to happen with the gic for next the year. gic yep okay and we won't get those projections for a little while still so. yep. and tom the any of the debt that's on here is debt that has already been authorized by town meeting this doesn't reflect the debt impact doesn't. of anything new Right. So we need to, you know, keep that in mind as we head into warrant season. Or any of the bands, because we haven't bonded yet. So we still have bands out there. Um, any other questions about the forecast? Nope. What are we doing on the ambulance, Chief? Are we same pace as last <laughs> year? Or? Chief, can uh, you come to the podium? Actually, it has increased. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> Thank you for that in depth analysis. <laughs> that we're in the process of doing too. Okay. You know, I would I would just um make a couple of a couple of comments about the forecast. You know, we're just really heading into it and, and as Tom said right now, you know, we've got a deficit on paper of about three quarters of a million dollars. Um, that's not a bad place to start. Uh, typically what happens in this is that, that, number, that number gets a little bit worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. um, and it also makes some assumptions about revenue that I would say are conservative, which is helpful because we don't want to kind of count, we don't want to build a budget on money that's not coming in. So. As in the past, in January, we'll get the motor vehicle excise commitments. Um, we will continue to monitor new growth. We will get an indication from the state of what our local aid might be. So as you know, I think for the next couple months, this forecast will remain the same, but probably as the budget books get issued, we may, you know, we may have an update. A lot of that data starts to come in in January, right? Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, health care, uh, some of these others. Um, Tom and Sue, the other thing that um, I might ask that we schedule later this fall, Sue, we had uh, somebody come in a year ago and give us a wonderful OPEB analysis. And what I seem to remember with OPEB was that there were a lot of moving parts with respect to legislation, with respect to our changing benefit programs. Coming in November. Yeah, so that would be great because Right now, the forecast is calling for next year to um, set aside $1.1 million for OPEB funding. And I think because this is in flux, it will be timely to have somebody come in at that point um, to, to help us all understand that. Okay. And Tom, just, you know, for purposes of the budget and timing, so what, you know, what happens next? So right now I'm anticipating issuing a budget message to the department heads on October 16th with my department uh, budget reviews, internal budget reviews, the week of the 23rd. We're looking for their departmental worksheets due back to us, their budgets due back to us in early November. I believe the second was the date. Uh, with capital requests due in on the 6th of November. Terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions or comments from the public before we move on? Okay. Um,
Before we uh, do appointments and selectmen town administrator reports, we have a couple votes, and I know that I, I keep seeing Mr. Falconeri peeking in through the window, so um, perhaps if we could um, take up those votes before the appointments, and um, I think I'm actually going to do the first possible vote fourth. Okay. If we could. <laughs> Do these two, the little guys first. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll make a motion uh, to uh, sign the employment agreement with the interim oh, town. We're going to hold that until the end. We're going to do the sidewalk um, one. Now. I'll make a motion to waive the permit fees associated with upgrading the fire alarm panel at the town hall. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Want to do the next one? Um, I make a, I make a motion that we approve the issuance of a special one day wine and malt license to Erica White on behalf of Galley Kitchen and Bar. Yeah. And, the, and Chief, you you're okay with that one, right? I, the copy I have. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying that. Okay. <laughs> 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 a liquor license. It's good. It's my it's my it's my one. It's no, the one, one thing I do. For God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if you have a few one-day liquor license parties, you can you pay for it. Okay, so you're okay with it. All right, so I have moved it. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Mr. Falconeri, um, so we have, uh, we have another vote this evening for the sidewalk. Could I, could I ask you or, or one of your representatives to just kind of give us an update? When, when you were here uh, at our last meeting, there was some discussion about the possibility of reopening the sidewalk during the period where um, ele prior to the issuance of a building permit and we appreciate that you've looked into that yep we've looked into it and we've actually completed it so we moved the fence back regraded and actually laid down asphalt to make a smooth pedestrian path okay. and so uh, you are I a question for you go okay. ahead, go ahead. Did your permit authorize you to break up the sidewalk originally? Yeah. Okay. All right. For sure. Okay. And um, Mr. Falconeri, you're seeking, I recall that last time you were seeking um, I came in a surprise. that it would be through uh, early January. Is that in terms of um, we're not going to extend it. Yeah, I, th I think that right so, now, tonight, or October 5th being today, is right. the last day that I had okay. the sidewalk's exposed. Over. Right. Okay. So we went ahead and moved it all, okay. graded it, and then I'll come back in front of you. Right. Okay. You know, so at the, that point, uh, Mary, it, w it would be a new, a new permit. So there is no vote that is needed tonight? No, th there is. This is... So what this does is you, you can do you don't have to I suppose you can do it the problem is if if you do it tonight it will become effective on the day that the permit is issued and which may not right. coincide with the meeting that's why I was yeah so I would suggest you take this vote tonight uh, it's not to, to initiate their their closure permit uh, immediately upon the issuance of the building permit so that you don't have to wait for another meeting so hypothetically I think what you're saying is if you get your building permit on December 1st okay. and we're not scheduled to meet until December 10th, right. you don't want to be held up. I can go to work. You can go to work. Okay. Exactly. And exactly. I guess my question is that there's a blank right now on the date to which that concludes, which is a little bit hard to predict right now. It is. But we could so, do something like we did before where it becomes just a check-in point. We, that's right. You, yeah. you know, what so, you, you tell so, us what you... So, um, You're going to do 120 days from the date of a permit being issued? Your first, your first look back was a three-month window. If he's telling you his development process is going to require a four-month window, then I suppose that's logical. Do you need four months? I'm anticipating it, yeah. Um, I'll just maybe... Pardon? Let me ask for 90 originally, then. Well, when I first came in front of you, I asked for for like six months and you said 
that you're a nice guy, come back and see you. So, <laughs> so it does sound like you, Paul. <laughs> it, it adds to the flavor of the project. <laughs> you know, if, Get a little update, you know, yeah. see how things are going. If I it's may, I, I noticed that we have um, some people in the audience from, from the downtown, so I might just sure. pause to yeah. see <laughs> if there is anyone in the audience who wishes to be heard on this before the board talks about a vote or a timetable. So I, anybody? Nan? Yeah, Nan, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the mic and introducing yourself, please. Uh, Nanette Walsh, 10 Rice Road. I have a cold, so pardon me. Um, I'm a merchant downtown. I'm adjacent to the Lincoln property at La Petite Maison at the corner of Main Street and North Street. And um, I understand there's been a delay, which is disappointing. Um, but having the fence go back is better, you know, to have some pathway. On the Main Street side, it's a, li a bit narrow. Um, it's not as generous as the South Street side. So I don't know if you've seen that. Um, so I, what I would like is to have um, better signage. And especially when you're approaching, say, from, um, from the corner of North Street to, you know, towards um, Main is having, a, you know, a sign saying sidewalks open something or sidewalks accessible. Because it's just not, I mean, they see this black fence. And to me, it's like, you know, construction zone. So. And my understanding is that some of the merchants wanted that black fence. Am I? Which is fine. Yeah, yeah. I have nothing wrong with okay. the screening, but I think the signage would help people understand that there's accessibility. Understand. It's black asphalt too. It's not a white sidewalk, so it's sure. not as clearly defined as a sidewalk. Yep. And like I said, it's just a wee bit narrower on the main street side. So if there's a parked car plus the tree and you're walking, it's it's a little bit of a squeeze. Okay. Thank um, you. And then the other issue, um, and I know that Lynn Barclay from the HDA has been working on is the signage saying that um, businesses are open and there, I think there's some changes to that. Or well, I think there was, I, I think we're limited. Lynn? Could I ask you, if, if you wouldn't mind, please, if I could ask you to come up to the microphone yeah. because um, sure. the voices in the audience don't carry across the TV and sure. give you a chance to introduce yourself. Yes, Lynn Barclay, um, Executive Director of the Downtown Association. Um, we were trying to get signage so that, to let people know that the businesses were open, open during construction. And it was an eyesore down there. So that's the reason that we mm -hmm. requested the screening. Um, but it's my understanding that we were limited with zoning, and that's why the sign is I, this I big. Believe, too I believe that has, doesn't have anything to do with Mr. Falconeri and the project that it has to do with right. our sign, our, our by signage bylaws. It does. So, no, Tom, are we, I, I know it's the size, mm -hmm. some of it is the size. Is there a limit to the number of them? Not that I'm aware. Well, it might be the total percentage. It, oftentimes, it's the total, total percentage of the, of the surface that they're being put on, uh, not to exceed a certain size. Because so I went down there I and looked. You can talk to Mike. Yeah, I went down there and looked after our last meeting, and, and I understand you put up signage that was as big as our bylaw allowed. Um, I, I, personally, I thought it was inadequate. And I'm, you know, can, well, is there, I can is talk there to something Mike we can do? Because, because, you know, to me, you sometimes see these big signs in communities that say like we're open come on in Park they're colorful parents. they're inviting and you know it's about that big and and there's like one of them on each side um, I I think what I might ask is can we take I think that's something that we have to take as a to-do okay I mean yeah, can we get we relief stack on that? a bunch no. of those signs together that's what I'm kind of wondering. You know, and do a word, a word, a word, whatever. Something. Yep. Yep. Because it is an animal. Yep. And then you have next to it the little ones that say you have to wear hard hats. And sure. It just, it's let, us, let us take that as a to-do because that has more to do with 
town bylaws than it does with this project. Okay. And we appreciate your bringing it to, to our attention. And also consider the sidewalk open sign. Yeah, okay. I know that last week when, when this first came up and um, uh, Mr. Falconeri <coughs> and his team were working pretty hard, I think we, we were not optimistic that we would even be able to get open what we did get open. Right. Again, I, I went down there and kind of looked at it and thought, wow, there's, this is going to be tougher to do than we were all sort of talking. So um, I, I think we're doing the best that we can. I'm, I think the sidewalk was open this week, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And is that going to stay like that until you get approval to move forward? Correct. Right. Exactly. Until the building permit is issued. And, and I think I hear Nan saying it would be helpful if it were a little wider on the Main Street side. It needs 48 inches from the curb to the fence, which four feet. Hey, granted, there's a tree there, the shade tree that you know we got approval to take down, but a lot of people didn't want us to take it down. So we're trying to work around that. Yep, yep. Paul, did you have? Yes, I have a question to the merchants. Is there an objection to having a viewing port in any of those fencing so people can see the construction? I guess, well, where would you want it exactly? I just figure a couple of spots along the fence so people to can. Observe yeah. the process? Yeah. Little kids like seeing that kind of stuff. Some big kids yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, again, I probably wouldn't want it on the main street side because there's not a lot of property there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the tunnel cap side is fine. And like I said, South Street has more room than main street. So. Maybe a Put little on the, on the tunnel cap side. Yeah. Like one of the Yeah, the tunnel cap panels. side is fine. It's, Beautiful. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank Perfect. you. Thank okay, you. so it sounds like really it would be helpful to get Thank moving on the okay. on the zoning piece. Like, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Welcome back, Betty. Yep. <laughs> sure, please. Question, comment. Sure, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> Dan Walsh, the husband of the owner of La Petite Maison. Uh, quick question, though, uh, and I'm new to this whole project here, but I understand that the project's being delayed, and we're talking about a 90 or 120 day delay or, or time frame here? No. Uh, no, what we're referring to is once the job gets up and going, how long will the sidewalks close for? Okay, but I'm wondering what the um, project's responsibility is for snow removal, if any. Um, those two sides, I do we're on our job side. Right, so that, that'll be responsibility of the, uh, the project to take care of that? Yeah, if the sidewalk's closed. If, the, if it's open, then you know, we'll, we still need access. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Chief? Hi. Uh, we did go down to the site with um, fire and the building inspector, and we met with Matt down there. Um, they were very cooperative. We ran over lots of different options, and I think he really came up with the best solution. Um, because of the time frame that we're unaware of, we, we, we were originally thinking <coughs> it impacted stone dust or type like that but we sort of talked about it and felt that uh, for the safety issues and so it wouldn't get rutted or if a rainstorm came along or in the case of snow that <coughs> the asphalt would be better um, and we talked about maintaining four feet four uh, you know the four foot width for the handicap access so they were very cooperative with it and i actually was hoping that as soon as they finished this and he put all this work into it the mbta would come along and sign it so um which is usually how projects go you finish them and then you get what you need but i think they've been very cooperative and i also we got to be careful because of the fence that's down there just uh i called him several times over the weekend as many other calls are on some of those wind storms those things are getting knocked over uh by the wind because of that fencing so he's got them all secured up the last thing i want them to do is fall over on a car so Whatever we put up on that fence, we have to be careful that we don't overload the fence uh, for when the wind comes along. Yep. They did fall over, and we left them felt we left them for the weekend that way just to uh, prevent them from falling on someone's park sure. car. So um, we got to be careful. But I, I I would sort of agree with one bigger sign as opposed to lots of little signs. I think it would actually look better for the downtown area. 
Yeah, yeah, that's just my yeah. opinion. We'll have to, we'll have to, I'll have to talk <laughs> to Mike. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, we also have to be careful yes. that, you know, as a board, we don't say, well, you know, we have these signed bylaws and everybody in the town has to follow them except us. Yeah. Well, but, you know, but it, it's also maybe a to do to think about that there's something in the bylaw that speaks to temporary signage in yep. situations like this. Like, that this is. We, we ought to be able to do this. Like, this yeah. isn't a sign that's going to stay up forever, but it's no. a sign that's. Yep. Thank Sometimes you. these circumstances yeah, bring that to your attention. Uncover right. an aspect of the bylaw that has unintended consequences. Right. So, I think what, what I'm hearing is that this, what we could do potentially tonight is to take a vote that allows the um, sidewalk to be closed upon issuance of the building permit. And I think what I hear Mr. Falconeri requesting is um, for 120 days following, following the, open, the closure of the sidewalk. Are we comfortable with that? Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. Could I, um, any further discussion or anything else that, OK. Could I ask Paul or Karen to make a motion? A move that uh, upon issuance of the uh, building permit, uh, pursuant to uh, Hingham General Bylaws Article 10, Section 4, the board consent to the request of RSL Realty LLC to close the portion of the public sidewalk within the public ways of Main Street and South Street directly abutting RSL's Realty's property at 5155 South Street for the period uh, commencing as of the date of the issuance of the building permit for the property uh, for 120 days subject to the following conditions. A, fencing shall be installed in accordance with Studio Myers Architecture and Design Plan, Construction Logistics Phase, parens L01, and parens dated June 16, 2017. B, police details shall be required as determined by the Hingham Police Chief. And C, signage directing pedestrians around the closed area and informing pedestrians that local shops are open during construction shall be installed and maintained. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Falconeri, thank you for working with all of the different constituencies on this project. Um, it's, it's important to the merchants. It's important to the town. The shade trees are important, the historical significance. We recognize it's a complex project. It's a tight site. Um, but I also think that the cooperation that we've all had have gotten us this far, and you know we look forward to continuing to cooperate in in the same manner. Might I also ask that as as you're getting your building permit, that you could please keep Ms. Barclay informed, so that um, she's aware when that permit is issued, because it sounds like there's going to be a whole lot of activity really quickly. So any sort of a heads up you can give her, no problem. She can convey to the merchants. Yep, no problem at all. Thank you again, and thank you for coming oh, back this you. evening. Thank you. <laughs> um, the the last uh, the last possible vote that we have. You, you get one other the is the appointments. Of appointments. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay. You want to do those first? Sure. I'll um, I'll move to appoint Stephen Dempsey to the Historical Commission for a three-year term ending June thirtieth, twenty twenty. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move that we appoint Jay Ippolito to the Veterans Council for a one-year term expiring June 30, 2018. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that's an unexpired term? Is that? Yeah. So that's a, that's the vacancy available. It'll we'll hit, it'll be re, um, you know reappointed presumably at the next yep. appointment process. Terrific. Yep. Okay. Um, the last vote that the board has this evening uh, relates to uh, an employment agreement with the interim town administrator. Um, everyone may recall that the town administrator special act that town meeting passed and that the legislature approved in, it was 2016? Mm -hmm. In 2016 actually defined that if a vacancy occurs in the town administrator position, this board is required to appoint an interim town administrator for a period of no longer than eight months. And um, it's my pleasure to uh, say that the board, uh, for the board's consideration this evening, is an employment agreement with our current assistant town administrator, hopefully interim town administrator, interim town administrator, um, Tom Mayo. Along with that, um, 
people who are watching, uh, this isn't a meeting from a couple of years ago. We're also joined at the table by Betty Foley. <laughs> <laughs> And um, as, part of, as part of this transition, uh, Betty has agreed, and we appreciate that, uh, to come back and work in the Selectman's office for a couple of days a week. Um, I think, Betty, you said it best to me, which is that uh, at one period when you were the interim town administrator, uh, you were kind of on your own. And that was, that was pretty difficult, difficult mm -hmm. um, particularly at this time of year as we're starting the budget and the warrants. So, um, we're really glad to get the band back together. <laughs> um, Paul or Karen, did you uh, have any anything to add before we take a vote? Uh, no, just um, you know, looking forward to, to working with you in this capacity. Uh, I've enjoyed um, working with you beginning uh, in May, and um, you know, I think uh, I think we're lucky to have you, and we're lucky to have Betty back. So, thank you. I've enjoyed working with you, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Looking forward to continuing to do so. Um, and I think, um, you know, in particular last year, Tom, your work on the warrant and the budget um, was really significant. And I think that you're going to be able to leverage that and um, uh, a lot of the other project work that you've done, whether it's spearheading the Barnes Wharf lease. Uh, working through the dog regulations at Bear Cove Park. Um, I think you're going to be able to leverage that experience and um, looking forward to it. So uh, would someone like to make a motion? Uh, I move that we sign the employment agreement with the interim town administrator uh, in a letter agreement dated September 29, 2017. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, Tom, town administrator reports? Sure. Mary, I know you were anticipating a letter to accompany this. However, that letter is not available. Okay. So I'm just going to read a statement that I think will um, we'll, uh, proclaim the town's pride regarding this, um, this issue. So regarding the subsidized housing inventory, uh, we are proud to announce that the town of Hingham has received the Department of Community Development's updated subsidized housing inventory for the town of Hingham. As of September 27th, 2017, the town has achieved an uncontested SHI of 11.37%. This DHCD calculation includes only a portion of the rental units at Linden Ponds. If all the units at Linden Ponds are counted as the town maintains they should be, the town's subsidized housing inventory is 20.57%. So I think that's something that um, everyone in Hingham, and especially this board, should be very proud of. The other uh, issue in my report, I just wanted to let everyone be aware that upgrades and repairs to the navigation lights on Route 3A over the Back River in Hingham and Weymouth will commence on 10:10, 10 -10, uh, starting at 9 a.m. That information will be shared throughout our social media um, accounts so that the public is as aware of them as we can make them. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? That's it. Okay. Paul? Uh, I'd like to welcome Tom. As, uh, our new man. Thank you. And I'm especially uh, thankful and grateful to see Betty at my side. <laughs> Always a pleasure sitting with you. Um, 3A task force is on the move. We've met, we have a plan, and we're, we're implementing. So uh, I'll keep you posted as we go. Um, South Hingham Working Group, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to a conclusion. Um, it is going to be a formidable report that is released. I anticipate that there will be a presentation um, made uh, to the Board of Selectmen. We'll invite the Planning Board to join us. Um, and I'm hoping that that will occur uh, on or about the month of November. Still working on some details, but it's <coughs> dense reading. Uh, and finally, in kind of a uh, interesting juxtaposition, talking about the fire trucks, you know, from the past and the bell tower. Um, my neighbor, Leroy Eldridge, 98 years old, passed away last night, and. Um, I knew, I first met Dr. Eldridge when I was just a little boy. Um, 
you want to talk about a townie or a hingamite that was the guy um, you know he was the town's doctor for the kids when we were all going through the, the grade schools uh, he had his office in his house um, and later up in the center uh, near the buttonwood tree um, a real gentleman and you know his his daughter Liz uh, continues on um, but he's he's a part of the character of this town that uh, has left and uh, I, I guess you know we will just continue on but his memory I think will be remembered fondly by so many people he was he was a real fine gentleman and I'm, I'm gonna miss him personally I, I always like talking to the doc so Thank you. There you go. Okay. Uh, I wanted to welcome both Tom and, and Betty to the table. We, uh, you, you've come just in time for us to <laughs> really start the heavy lifting. So great, great timing on your part, but um, looking forward to working with you both uh, okay. in the coming months. Um, you know, we all were at a, a send off for, for Ted Alexiades this week um, uh, that really brought together um, you know, a number of volunteers and former elected officials. And, you know, you walk into the room and you see that um, sort of level of civic engagement by um, the folks who live in this town and, and everybody coming together, I think, to say thank you to Ted for his contributions. It was just, uh, I thought, a really heartwarming event. Um, I also played, I was back at the country club again. I played in the um, South Shore Country Club um, Scramble fundraiser that raises some additional funds for South Shore Country Club and um, the friends of the South Shore Country Club also spoke at that event to talk about, you know, the the planning around um, the the potential pool development um, and other kind of recreational type assets that you know may may be part of that um, footprint. So um, I think it was a, a always a great event to be at, at the club. It was in great shape and uh, and great turnout. Again, I think showing the town's uh, support for that. Asset, I've been working um, with uh, the Affordable Housing Trust and Father Bills um, this time on uh, the Rust House, which was just recently acquired by Father Bills from the Congregational Church. Uh, we are working, although we, you know, we do have great news on our percentage of affordable housing, we are trying to work with the state to recognize those additional units as affordable housing units um, in the town. So. We are moving forward to work, you know, to try to open some discussions with DHCD uh, on that front. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Dr. Eldridge, and I know that you're going to speak about um, Ann Collins, but, you know, like the gathering at the country club, um, you know, it, it's those folks that have gone before us that have forged that path and created that legacy. And part of that legacy has been their civic mindedness, their willingness to give back and serve this community that makes it possible for all of us to sit here. So um, I'm mindful of, of them and their families and their, their contribution to this town. Thank you. Um, just a couple things. I've been uh, uh, having a little bit of discussion with the advisory committee debt working group, um, which has been doing some great work to help us as a community give us some data so that we can all start to have conversations around financing and prioritizing long-term capital projects. Um, the working group is going to be presenting their work to the advisory committee next week. They will be here at our meeting on the 24th to share that with us. I've also encouraged them to share it with the school committee, <coughs> the library trustees, and other committees that are advancing uh, large capital projects. Um, I'd like to congratulate Captain uh, William Powers, who has been appointed Deputy Fire Chief for Operations, and that's going to be effective in early 2018 as our Fire and Emergency Services Department uh, undergoes some leadership transition. Um, I'd also like to congratulate Tom Betchart and Brent Karipla. Hope I got that name right. Um, they both uh, recently graduated from the Massachusetts Fire Academy. I had the privilege of um, attending their swearing in as members of the Hingham Fire Department the other night. And um, uh, Chief Bob Olson is in the audience. And I just want to thank you for instituting um, really a celebration of the promotions and the achievements of members of the Fire and Emergency Services Department and really making that a family event. 
Um, it's really touching to see mothers pinning badges on sons and daughters or children doing that and <coughs> families gathering together and members of the fire department coming together to welcome and congratulate their colleagues. It's, it's really just very, it's terrific. Um, as Karen mentioned, in addition to Dr. Eldridge, um, uh, Hingham lost another very significant member of our community this week, and that's Mrs. Ann Collins. Um, she served on the um, Hingham School Committee. I believe she was only the second woman elected to the school committee. She served on the Hingham Industrial and Development Committee, the Shipyard Committee, the Hingham 375th Anniversary Committee, um, I remember her because when I was the advisory liaison to the high school field project, she was a member of that committee. She also held a number of leadership positions in local and statewide uh, re Republican Party. Um, Mrs. Collins was named Citizen of the Year in 2010 for all these innumerable contributions. And you know, on, on behalf of the town, uh, we extend our condolences to the family and friends of, of all who knew both of them. And, um, and she ran for selectmen. We, and she ran for selectmen. Thank you, Jim. And as, as Karen said, um, uh, their, their level of civic engagement um, is really a model for all of us. And uh, it's something that we, we carry with us. Um, the board is going to um, enter into executive session um, to discuss uh, personnel matters, <coughs> uh, not to return to open sessions. So. Uh, I'd like to recommend that the board enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to personnel issues because discussions of these matters in open session may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the town. Roll call vote. Aye. 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 Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.